Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I want to assure you, if you have never used R before, that it's not as scary as it might seem. Um, I am not an archaeologist, nor am I a statistician. I'm a biogeographer. I've been working with archaeologists for 20 years. We started in 1995 developing a statewide predictive model for Minnesota, which we completed in 98 and have been using for 20 years and clearly needed to be updated. Um, I have been fortunate that I've uh, uh, had stat good statisticians to work with uh, throughout all of this time. Um, Carla Landrum, who is my co-author on this presentation, is a, the current statistician on our project, and she is the one who got us using R. So I thought what I'd talk about is how, why we decided to go to R and what my experiences have been with R and show you basically what our procedures are uh, because we can make our scripts available to anyone else who wants to use any of the procedures that they include. Um, so I'll talk about the R components we're using, our modeling procedures, our results, which I'm really pleased with, and my, my insights. So why did we use R? We, we used S plus for our original models back in the 90s um, because that's what our statistician at the time, Dr. El Gary Ellert from the University of Minnesota was familiar with. And S plus is a very expensive package. Um, and uh, Carla, our new statistician, uh, was more familiar with R and it's free, hey. So that was one of our reasons for going with R. Um, this is our, just our generalized workflow. Um, basically, we have our, our archaeological data that we use to sample our environmental variables. We also sample our variables with a grid of points to represent our total environment, our total modeling region. Feed all of that into the R software. We've been taking it out of uh, the GIS data simply as CSV files, uh, feeding it into R. Uh, and doing our modeling and then spitting out more CSV files that then are converted back into GIS rasters. And I'll talk about why we just use that procedure in a minute. Um, we did actually two types of models in R. Uh, we did a historic vegetation model. This was part of our data development uh, stage of our process where uh, we were uh, we spent actually a lot more time on data development than on modeling. Uh, many years, as a matter of fact, uh, cleaning up the archaeological data, doing quality control, um, and uh, working on our geomorphic data, which had um, a lot of different areas had been mapped using different classification systems. We had to get it all into something that we could was consistent that we could use. The historic vegetation model was an attempt to model historic vegetation uh, at a higher resolution than what we had available. Uh, and I'm pointing it out here simply because we have this um, script that will do this classification model. And if you have some kind of data that you want to classify, we'll have something you can use, but I'm not gonna focus on that today. And then our archeological predictive model, which uh, is uh, to help us determine either where we should avoid having transportation projects because we have a high potential of uh, archaeological sites or if we can avoid those areas to help us target where we need to survey. Our R components, we used R Studio with our notebook. Uh, it, it, all of these things are free and, and downloadable from the web. Um, and this is what the interface looked like. Um, the advantage of using our notebook is that it can give you an output HTML file, and this saves a lot of time for documenting your procedures and your results. All of your uh, results will, will, will go into this HTML file, and you can simply uh, print it out at the end or uh, save it as a, um, in, in, in a number of formats. So uh, our notebook was a very handy tool um, in addition to R. Um, I mentioned that we took our data in from GIS into R using CSV files. We originally thought we were going to use R ArcGIS Bridge 
as the interface between R and GIS. And we started trying to work with that and decided that it really was not worth the trouble. Uh, our files first were too big. We model our state, uh, we divide it into ecological regions to begin with for modeling. So we have 20 different regions that we model of varying size. Our pilot region was not one of the larger regions and R was really struggling. Our, our, R wasn't struggling, ArcGIS Bridge was struggling. Um, R was struggling partially because we could not run Arc Bridge in 64-bit um, mode um, using ArcGIS software. To run in 64-bit, with you have to use um, ArcGIS Pro, and ArcGIS Pro doesn't have spatial analysts, and since we we're doing raster modeling, we needed spatial analysts so we were having to run it in 32-bit and of course it just wasn't working with our large data sets so we just decided that there had to be a better way to use large data sets and go between r and arcgis and that ended up just simply being exporting the csv files uh, worked beautifully um, quickly i'll go through our modeling procedures they're very standard basic procedures um, and you know if you wanted to you know start out with a script that's already written and then modify uh, this would would get you a lot of the, the real basic analyses that, that you might need to do the first part of our script is exploratory data analysis and i'll i'll point out that carla the statistician wrote these scripts in r and wrote a nice little user manual to go with them uh, and then the rest of us were completely unfamiliar with R. None of us were statisticians. We took these scripts, we ran through them as she wrote them, went, oh, well, wouldn't it be nice to do this? Ask Carla a question or look something up online, fiddle with the script. We got pretty comfortable with actually making the modifications we needed. Once we had the basic language in front of us and knew what it was doing, we could figure out how we could modify it. So it's it's not a really steep learning curve as far as I'm concerned. And it was particularly easy for our Python programmer. Uh, he was familiar enough with uh, some of the programming language in R that he was able to really extend what we were doing uh, where necessary to get the kind of output that we wanted. Um, not, not really changing the statistical analysis, but changing the output parameters so that we got the output we, we like to see. So our exploratory data analysis staff does all of this uh, very standard statistical stuff and makes lovely graphs. We get histograms, we get these beautiful uh, graphs of the uh, distribution of every variable for the site and non-site locations. Just, just lovely results that are easy to uh, interpret. Uh, we then, after the exploratory data analysis, which we use to clean up the data, uh, we run a random forest model. Uh, random, I don't know if you're familiar with random forest, I'm in love with it. Uh, when we did modeling in the 90s, we used stepwise, stepwise multiple logistic regression because that's what was being used for predictive modeling at that time. Random forest is producing much better models, very precise models. And, Carla and I disagree to a certain extent about why we're getting these lovely models. Uh, I say, oh my God, Random Forest is great. And Carla says, no, no, you guys spent so much time cleaning up your data. That's why you're getting better models. So, but I, I think it's probably both. Uh, but uh, Random Forest uh, run, it's a tree classification method and it runs a lot of trees is basically what it does. That's why it's called a forest. Um, and it provides um, some lovely um, graphics that, that show you how well it's uh, doing. You can, you can also tune the model uh, to optimize the output. Um, this particular graph is showing uh, the, um, it's the graph we use for determining how many um, variables should the model should look at at each node on each tree. So you can, you can tune your model by adjusting that. This is the, the it's called the M-try. You can also optimize your model by telling it how many trees to run and you get another graph that uh, helps you make that decision. 
So we run one model. This is the graph that helps you determine the number of trees. You see that <clears throat> the error rate drops rapidly as you increase the number of trees and then it levels off. Um, we run one model that's not tuned, use the output from that model to tune the model to, to decide how many uh, variables at each node and, um, thank you, and how many trees we want to run for the tuned model. For every model, we also get this lovely uh, graph of how the, each variable performs. I, I, I happen to love this output because it helps me decide whether it's worth uh, developing particular data, running particular variables in the first place. Um, so it tells us the increase in the uh, percent increase in the mean square error if we remove a variable. So the, the variables up at the top, uh, in this case, um, cost pass dis distance to the nearest wetland uh, would change the model greatly if we took that out. Whereas if we took surface roughness, which is at the bottom, we removed that from the model, it wouldn't make much difference. So we get a lot of information about our variables. Uh, we get a lot of good information for assessing model performance. We can uh, run our models based on uh, training data and uh, test it with some testing data. We can do random splits of the data right in R. And um, we can uh, get a very nice output based on the confusion matrix uh, with a number of measures of uh, model accuracy. We get the rock curves, which show us the area under the curve to indicate, again, how accurate our model is. Uh, we can determine our maximum accuracy cutoff. Obviously, our, our models our, uh, the raw model is a uh, range of values between zero and one. And for uh, our, you know, our interpretation of the model, uh, for the practitioners, uh, we want to have high, median, high and, and low probability areas for archaeological sites. And uh, this curve helps determine the, the maximum accuracy cutoff. Um, and also we get a, um, a, a numeric indication of what's the mac the met the what number within the model is our maximum accuracy cutoff export to gis and classify it using the maximum accuracy cutoff and you get a map of high and low potential for archaeological sites um, we also tested other decision rules for classifying our models we turn it turns out that the maximum accuracy cutoff because we have more background points than we have sites. It's, our models are actually better at, S, are, at predicting the, the um, background points. In other places, what are not sites. Um, so our maximum accuracy cutoff, usually if we use that, we have um, high probability areas that capture 80 to 85% of our sites. And we wanted to see what would happen if we tried to capture a higher percentage. And it turns out we can make our uh, models uh, where we make the decision rule that 95% of our sites are in high probability and they're still very, very precise and very accurate models. We still have a very high um, rate of uh, true negatives uh, in our models. So um, we ended up to be consistent across the state using our 95% decision rule for classification rather than the maximum accuracy cutoff. We still have very high um, accuracy, very high rates of true positives, obviously 95% true positives and um, in the 90s uh, percents of uh, true negatives. So this shows our accuracy of our final models after they're classified. Um, the um, very straight line across the top is the you know, percent of uh, sites predicted, the specificity. The green line uh, is the percent of um, non-sites accurately predicted, the sensitivity. Uh, accuracy is in between them because it's uh, uh, based on both. The um, blue line at the bottom shows the percent area classified as high probability, which is less than 20% everywhere and it's much better than our earlier models. And then the uh, gain statistic, Kwame's gain statistic, you can see is the purple line, and that varies because the amount of area uh, classified as high probability varies. 
Uh, this is what our final model looks like. We model both archaeological site distributions and survey distributions because we know surveys have been not random by any means. Archaeologists survey where they think they'll find sites. Uh, so we try to give the archaeologists a head up of uh, what areas we think have been under-surveyed. Uh, we don't want to say an area is low probability if we don't have a pattern of archaeological survey there. So these are what our final models look like. They're very, very, very precise, particularly when compared to our previous models. And our insights. Uh, categorical variables can cause some problems, uh, particularly if you have rare values. I won't get into that detail, but if you do have categorical variables, we have procedures for dealing with them. We also had a problem with null values. Our soils data, our um, values are missing in certain areas, urban areas, their soils don't have any data in them. Um, mining areas, disturbed areas. So we ended up doing two models, one without soils data, one with soils data, and then we can use the one without soils data to fill in those null areas. Uh, memory requirements were considerable. Uh, worked a lot better with 124 gigabytes of RAM, with 64 gigabytes of RAM, which is what I have on my computer. I could not run some of the regions without splitting them up. Uh, and conclusion, you've got pluses and minuses. The, 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 uh, the costs are whatever it takes to convert from whatever methods you were using previously. Obviously, RAM, if you don't have enough, it's not going to work real well. And there is a learning curve, but as I said, it's, it's not as bad as I expected. The one thing that, that does bug me about R is that the syntax keeps changing. So if I have one version of R on my computer and everything's running great, and then I tell someone on my team, okay, you know, put R on your computer and run this script, uh, he might download a newer version of R and there may be some part of the script that doesn't run because they changed the syntax between the two versions. That does bug me. But other than that, we've had uh, great luck with it. Um, benefits, obviously it's free. The tools are powerful. They're readily available. Uh, you get a lot of efficiencies and, and replicability from the scripting process. Uh, our notebook really is nice for documentation. And you can actually easily go back and forth between R and ArcGIS without using our bridge. It's really quite simple. So if, you, or if you're interested in our scripts or our procedures, uh, Google MinModel, not up there yet. We're, we're working on documentation right now. We'll be putting all of this up, we hope, by the end of July, because uh, that's when I'm retiring for good. <laughs> and, uh, so, so keep an eye on it, and we will be able to share all of our, our scripts and procedures. And we have some scripts, actually, that we never ran that Carla developed using other procedures that she said she didn't recommend, but it's other, other modeling procedures besides uh, random forest. So we have a number of things we can share with people. Thank you.